Hey guys, welcome to Individual Investor and welcome to this second episode on my Phil Towns Rule 1 investing series. This time, I'd like to show you guys an analysis for the ASML stock, which is a semiconductor company giant that caught my attention recently as a potential Rule 1 stock. Let's take a look. If you want to know in more detail the exact process that I follow to find and test Rule 1 stocks, please check out my first video where I break down step by step the full analysis for the TSM stock, which is a company that I'm currently following as a potential investment for my Rule 1 portfolio. As a disclaimer, I haven't invested in TSM yet because there is a slight concern I have. Warren Buffett, late last year, invested in TSM and just now he actually sold his entire position in TSM and increased his position in Apple. There is some speculation that Apple, who is a major customer of TSM, will actually bring its cheap manufacturing in-house, which will obviously impact future revenues of TSM. Anyway, ASML is actually another great option in the same semiconductor sector, and let me show you why. As you know, I like to use Morningstar to do my due diligence on stocks, in this case, we're looking here at the analyst report for ASML. And if we go first to the economic mode, we can see that they assigned a white mode to ASML, which is great. That's one of the criteria for rule one investing. And in terms of the quality of management, I like to look at the capital allocation as a proxy for quality of management. Obviously, if you have good management in a business, they're doing, they should be doing a great job at allocating capital. So in this case, Morningstar has assigned a, an exemplary capital allocation rating for ASML. So basically, um, we are good to go here. In terms of the numbers, if we go to my spreadsheet, here's the data for the last uh, 10 years. And, and you know these are the big five the return invested capital sales revenue growth eps growth book value and free cash flow or just uh, cash position um, i already extracted all the figures and we can see here that pretty much everything checks out so in terms of the return on invested capital the average is 21.20 uh, percent and the requirement here is to have at least a 10% or more in each one of the big five criteria. For uh, sales revenue and EPS, the same, very strong figures in the last 10 years. Book value, as you can see here, 8%, uh, so slightly uh, below 10. However, it's been, actually, in the last two years is where we saw, uh, especially the last year where we saw a decline here, otherwise it would have been 10. So uh, I'm gonna show you, um, more information on that later. And also free cash flow as well was growing very rapidly as well, uh, year over year. But then we saw a, a drop here in the last year from 11.7 billion to 7.6 billion. However, the overall 10 year average is not impacted and is still pretty good sitting at 27.22%. So what happened here, um, the book value, basically the shareholders equity took a little bit of a hit in the last, um, in the last year. Obviously here, 8.04% doesn't quite meet the criteria for at least a 10% growth in book value over the last 10 years. However, Phil Town says in the book that if one of the figures doesn't quite cut it, you can still invest in the stock if you can find a good justification for the figure not being at least 10%. So in this case, I went straight to the annual report to see if I was able to find the reason for that uh, decrease in book value. So what I found was that the reason for the decrease in book value or shareholders equity is actually an increase in liabilities. So we can see here that actually the current liabilities went up from almost 13 billion to almost 18 billion here. So if we look at total liabilities, we have 20 billion in 2021 and then 27 billion 
as of 2022. And as you know, book value is the same as shareholders equity, which is the total assets minus the total liabilities. And the reason for this increase is that if you can see here, the, there's an increase in net contract liabilities as of December 31st, 2022, mainly driven by the recognition of down payments for systems which will be shipped in the future and consideration received for fast shipment systems that, that's, that have been delivered. So I investigated a little bit about the fast shipments here and what ASML does is that as you know, they, they make chips, silicon, uh, micro circuits, and micro components basically that require extensive quality assurance and, and testing after being built. And these tests, they can do either in-house, ASML, they do the tests, or they just make, build, or fabricate the, the chips and then ship them to the customer and then the end customer does the testing. So in order to save customers or to save their customers time, what they do is that after manufacturing the chips, they ship them straight to the customer and then the customer can do all the testing themselves. However, they don't recognize revenue until the end customer finishes testing and doing all the quality assurance and then reports back to ASML that everything was good. So this is what happened that post pandemic, they started to keep the supply um, ahead of the demand they started shipping out um, goods as they were producing them and then letting the customer do the testing on their side so they are not recognizing a lot of this revenue. And that's why as well, if we look here at the cash flow, free cash flow, there is a drop in free cash flow as well because they haven't received any money for this. So obviously there's a little bit of risk in that, but this reason, in my opinion, is justifiable. Okay, so having said that, we are good here and now the financial health check, so we need to make sure that we can pay the long-term debt in less than three years. And in this case, these guys, they have tons of cash flow here. So the long-term debt is 3.5 billion and the free cash flow as of last year is 7.6 billion. And the, the, the ratio, the debt to free cash flow is 0.46. So they're super healthy in terms of uh, being able to pay off their debt okay and now moving on to the sticker price so here we have the uh, eps the latest eps the growth from both zacks and yahoo are actually very optimistic i hope it's, it stays like this so almost 30 percent for both of them uh, the pe default we double the estimate uh, in this case roughly 60 but the historic pe is uh, in the last five years is actually 41.19 so we have to stick to the lower of the two PEs and ROI 15% uh, that's based on what Field Town recommends that we should expect in terms of the return on our investment and a time horizon of 10 years and as you know or as you might remember from uh, the first video here the future stock price is just a future price calculation using the EPS, the growth, the lower of the growth estimates and the lower of the PEs and a time horizon of 10 years. And then the sticker price will be, we take that future stock price and we bring it back using the present price or present value formula. And uh, we take it back 10 years and discount 15%. So we end, end up at $2,000 roughly uh, margin of safety is half of the sticker price, so $1,044. And finally, the current price is $651. So we are well within the margin of safety here, so the investment should be safe. Now, finally, there is the technical analysis component as well. We have, uh, I'm using TradingView. Here we have the daily for ASML and we are plotting here the 10 day moving average in blue. I also have the volume here, which is not a requirement for rule one investing, but I like to look at the volume as well. And here we have the MACD and the stochastic 
which I, the stochastic, I change the values here from one and three for K smoothing and desmoothing to five and five to smooth the line a little bit more. And um, yeah, it's looking right now we are, let me move this out of the way. So as you can see, I have also all my alerts here because I'm waiting on the MACD to actually cross the signal line and I'm waiting also on the stochastic on the K line to cross the D line. And so I wanna be alerted straight away. And I kind of regret not uh, paying attention to this stock earlier. As you can see here, this would have been a great opportunity to get in um, if we look at this segment here, um, price action started climbing above the 10 day moving average. Volume also was pretty high. Okay, lots of accumulation there above the average. And also you can see here the MACD above the signal line, also stochastic in the right trend. So this would have been a great opportunity to, to, uh, to buy right here and get in and then you could have probably stayed in up until here where um, we went the price dropped below the 10 day moving average and also the MACD and the stochastic started giving signals um, as well to indicate to get out um, here we had a little bit of a the price action actually dropped here below the 10 day moving average but as you know uh, pair rule one criteria here for the technical analysis, you get out when all three, when the price action, the MACD and the stochastics all tell you to get out. But in this case, even though price action and the stochastic was not in the right place, the MACD would have kept you still in the game because the blue line or the MACD line was still above the signal line. Okay. so. I'm gonna still be monitoring this very closely, guys, and um, if anything changes, I'll make another video, but for now, I just have my alerts here ready to go. All right, guys, that brings me to the end of this video. If you are enjoying my content so far, I would really appreciate if you can hit the like button and subscribe to my channel to stay up to date with my videos. And also, if you are currently doing any rule one investing yourself, I'm really curious and interested to see what your feedback or comments are. So please leave them in the section below. Thank you again, and I'll see you next time.